until my dad told me that he thought the squash seeds were bad. He brought home radish seeds and they seemed to work a lot better. This is day four to the next week. So without counting the squash seeds, I have to say that the seeds and bowl B grew faster than that of the seeds and bowl A. Results. What really happened? Throughout the experiment, I noticed that the tap watered plants grew or sprouted in just a few days. Now these were the radish seeds. The squash seeds had finally sprouted a couple days ago. So these are the radish seeds I'm talking about right now. The sugar watered plants show no life whatsoever. I think I killed the seeds in bowl A. But the sugar water was really sweet. So what happened to my hypothesis? I found out the truth. If you want plants to grow, don't water them with sugar water. harvester ants. Uh, I used a refrigerator and I also used an electric heater. Now uh, what my purpose of my project was to, is to, was to find out uh, if ants would survive better or be more active in cold or hot temperatures. Uh, so what I did was I took uh, the ant farm and the ants and I placed the ants in the ant farm. I did wait a, I did wait a couple days uh, for them to start digging around uh, in the ant farm, and then uh, what I did was I placed, I, sorry, I checked the temperature of the refrigerator, and the temperature was 49 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I placed the ant farm in the refrigerator for 10 minutes, and when I took them out, I noticed that the ants were actually moving a lot slower if they were moving at all. And uh, so what I did afterwards is I placed that same ant farm uh, next to my electric heater in my room and uh, I measured, I calculated the temperature 
and the temperature next to my heater was 79 degrees Fahrenheit and I left it there for 10 minutes as well and uh, I was watching it because uh, in the fridge I couldn't really watch the ants but I did it next to my heater and the ants were slowly like uh, they were warming up and starting to move around again and uh, they actually, it actually got to a point where they actually wanted to get out of the ant farm they were kind of getting kind of hot and <laughs> they wanted to get out so uh, what I concluded from this was that ants don't do very well in extreme temperatures of hot and cold and uh, if I was to redo this project I, was, I would probably uh, make sure like do something different for testing the warm because I feel like maybe the next to the heater wasn't the best but uh, that could have been done better but overall I think the project went pretty well and uh, yeah. Also, um, just kind of like Sam, uh, so I'll just be telling you about that. So, the purpose of my uh, experiment was, of course, to determine if water temperature affects the movement of a fish's mouth, like how many times they breathe, and its operculum. Now, its operculum is the tiny gills that are on each side of its head. That's the operculum. Now, my hypothesis was, when fish are exposed to colder and colder water, their body movements will slow down, their breathing and their movement of the operculum will slow. So that was my hypothesis. So let's see if it came true. The materials that I used were, of course, goldfish. I used a bowl, fish food, ice cubes, one jar, and thermometers. Now, how did I use these? Well, let me tell you the procedure. So first I put goldfish in the jar with room temperature water and the temperature was about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> then I observed how the fish, fish breathed in this temperature of water. And I recorded the number of times that it opened its mouth, that they opened their mouth in this um, water, and I did this for one minute. Now, after this, I placed the jar in a bowl of ice, and the purpose of this was to bring the temperature slowly down. And I, went, I was observing like, if the temperature change would affect the way they breathed. And I brought the temperature down all the way to 40 degrees, from 64 degrees. And it was interesting because at room temperature, at 64 degrees, the average uh, amount that they breathed, the times they opened their mouth, was 65 times. But when I changed the water temperature to 40 degrees, it slashed that to 38 times a minute that they opened their mouth. So a very significant difference there. Um, and what I concluded from that was that my hypothesis was actually true, that the colder you make the water, the fish uh, get slower and slower, their body movements and their breathing. And the reason for this is, is because in the winter, when it gets colder, they need to conserve their energy so that they can stay alive, they can keep warm. So my control group was the fish in room temperature water. Um, that, was, that was my control, 65 degrees, um, excuse me, 64 degrees. And this is the water that I determined that they breathe in the best. My experimental group was the fish in the different temperatures, the 40, 48 degree water. Um, and I experimented with that to see what the difference would be. So my results were before the water temperature was dropped from room temperature to 40 degrees using ice, they opened their mouth 65 times. And at 40 degrees, they opened it 38 times. So by this, I conclude that my hypothesis, which was uh, that when it gets colder, the water gets colder, their movement will slow down. So what could I have done better in this experiment? Um, instead of maybe using 10 fish, which is what I started with, I could have used one fish only because it would eliminate some variables um, such as like, size and age of the fish. Um, instead of using more than one, I could use one. Um, also, what I could have done is eliminate another variable, which was, instead of using ice, I could have used some other form of a way to bring the temperature down, like refrigeration or bring it to the freezer. 
So these are things that I would experiment with and do different on my next experiment. Alrighty, so with that I'll call Elise up. Okay, so the title of my project was DNA Extraction. Um, can anybody guess what I did? No. I have no idea. No? Well, I extracted DNA. Um, so, the project purpose was that I was going to try to extract DNA from blood and saliva using the same methods. And my hypothesis was that I was going to be able to do that. Um, so, I, in order to do that, you need to have a cup with salt water, uh, kind of gargle that in your mouth, spit back into the cup, add some dish soap, and pour a little bit of rubbing alcohol, and you should be able to see some DNA start to kind of float to the surface, with little strands of DNA. And the reason because of that is that the dish soap has hydrophilic and hydrophobic ends and the hydrophilic end attaches to the water and the hydrophobic end is attached to the cell membrane and it breaks the cell membrane allowing the DNA to uh, come out of the cell and the alcohol helps uh, extract the DNA and the alcohol should float on the water creating a, a separate layer and you should be able to extract your DNA I tried doing that with blood and it was more difficult because first of all nobody wanted to give up their blood, you know. They were afraid of the needle. So my dad was going to do it, but then I was too scared to poke him. So then he... I would have poked him for you. <laughs> so then later he chickened out and just left. Then he came back, grabbed the needle and just poked himself. So I was able to do it with blood, but I was not successful because blood is made up of mostly red blood cells, right? And red blood cells do not have a nucleus, therefore they don't have DNA. And there's very little DNA, and we have got very little blood. And because of that, you need a special um, enzyme, protein enzyme, to help extract the DNA. And uh, yeah, we weren't able to do that. So my hypothesis was wrong. The next person is Christy. So the title of my experiment was called Beans Unseen. So what was the purpose of my experiment? Well, the purpose was like when you get stuffy nose or get sick uh, and you eat, you uh, tend to not smell the flavor as well as when you are not sick. So the problem that I come up with was that without the sense of smell, can a person distinguish between different tastes? And I made the hypothesis that if a person is blindfolded and cannot smell, then they cannot detect uh, flavors as well as when they are only blindfolded. And the variables that I used will uh, flavor people and water. And the flavor, because sometimes uh, other people may know the flavor more than you do, they might not be familiar with the other flavors. And then Sometimes uh, people can be have a better taste bud than you do, and the water is the amount of water I use between each flavor. And my dependent variable is how people reacted to the each flavor, and my independent variable was the flavor. So uh, I the materials that I used were the jelly beans, a paper a paper to record, and a cup of water for each person and also uh, a cup of water and throughout those uh, with six volunteers so first uh, the six volunteers would guess four different flavors of jelly beans they were all the same with their only blindfolded and then one hour later with the same people but they would, their nose would be plugged and they would guess the flavors so the result that I got from this experiment was that two, three flavors were guessed right, 
guess right in the nose unplugged, and then two flavors were guess correct in the nose plug. So my hypothesis was proven true. And what I can get from this experiment is that when I conducted the experiment from the control group, uh, the flavors that they guess were uh, they guess it very well, and then the experimental group they guess it not quite so well. So then the, the test was affected. So if I were for uh, future research, my experiment, I would do the order of people and also use a smell, a, also use a flavor that they would be the most familiar with. So the next person would be Karen. So, how many of y'all like coral reefs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're beautiful. Like last uh, summer, we went down to Mexico, got our uh, scuba diving license, went down on some dives, and we saw a beautiful coral reef. But there's one problem for the coral reef and other ocean structures, and that is the existence of OA. Ocean acidification. And now, what is ocean acidification? It's, it's basically where uh, carbon dioxide is emitted from you know, cars, cities, and power plants, and it goes into the atmosphere, and then it is absorbed by the ocean. Now, the ocean, its pH is somewhat alkaline. It's around at eight, 8 or 9, and um, since they started tracking ocean acidification, it has gone down from an 8.9 all the way down to an 8.1. But even before that, they were talking about something called acid rain. It's pretty much the same thing, just not in the ocean water, rather in rainwater. Uh, the rain water, it had the carbon dioxide, made it more alkaline. The carbon dioxide in mid um, I mean, acid, acidic, uh, it being absorbed into the water brought the pH down. And the problem with this is that it rains down and it goes into the ground, and now the calcium in the ground is trying to counteract for that pH difference. So it starts dissolving, dissolves away to try to bring it back up to its alkaline state, and it's taking away the nutrients that the trees and plants need to use to thrive. But the same thing happens in the ocean, except instead of in the ground, it happens on the backs and insides of sea creatures. The shells and skeletons, yeah. Um, so this is a big problem because it makes the, the calcium dissolve. And if, if your skeleton's dissolving, that's a big problem. So this is also happening with coral. And my experiment basically what I did is, I was demonstrating uh, ocean acidification. Uh, I took cuttlefish bones, you can get these at a pet store, uh, they're for parakeets, I think. Um, and you can, so these are calcium based. So I took these and I put them in six different solutions, uh, started from a pH of 9, went all the way down to a pH of, of 4, and my hypothesis, obviously, was that the ones in the acidic solution would dissolve. Now, my hypothesis was, it was not exactly solidly proved, proven. Um, we can see that most of the weights of the cuttlefish actually went up, except this one, uh, which was in the four. It was a very acidic solution. And it was this size, and it went down to this size, and it, yeah, it, it dropped by about four grams. Yeah, four grams. So quite drastic. The reason why I think it, this didn't show in the rest of my statistics was because the density of the cuttlefish bones uh, increased quite a bit, and they they have not the water has not all gone out of them. There there's still there's still water in them. So because they're actually heavier still than my dry weight at the beginning. Um, However, you can still see the effects of buffering. 
all of the uh, beginning pHs, they were buffered down to the uh, pH of, of around 6 to 8. So this is a pretty big problem. Um, and there are a couple solutions. We can cut down, of course, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions by substituting that with uh, natural energy sources and you know, like solar, wind. But also, we can... What do you think uh, is a good source of carbon dioxide absorption? Plants. Plants. Right. What, what type of plant do you think we could, could plant? Trees. Right. Trees? Trees. All right. Yeah. Trees. An acre of trees actually absorbs 4.8 uh, 4 tons of carbon dioxide per acre per year. It's really amazing, right? No. <laughs> no, it's not. An acre of algae absorbs 2,000 Two million, sorry, yeah, two million tons of carbon dioxide per acre per year. And trees just absorb 4.8 tons. So that could be a, a very, uh, an amazing solution for it, uh, planting algae. Planting, that's a weird word, sorry. <laughs> Growing algae. Um, and that could be a, a very good way to fix this problem that is dissolving uh, the coral sea creatures, the ocean floor, and even taking away the nutrients from the trees and plants. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so to begin with, I'm going to read you a verse that comes from Genesis chapter 1, and it's verses 11 through 12, and it says... And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after this kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And then the previous verse says, And God saw that all the creation, which is all the plants that he had created, it was very good. So now, my experiment was, was about photosynthesis. Now this experiment was kind of, it gave me the idea to do this experiment because I work on the farm, and I thought it would be an interesting way to figure out if I could figure out how plants would grow under different types of light. If I could get different types of light to make plants grow better, because I want plants to grow as fast as they can, so I can sell them as fast as I can, and you know, the whole process. And so, therefore, my experiment was about photosynthesis. Now, my hypothesis was is that the red and blue lights would make the plants grow better than the yellow and the white and the green light that I also had in my experiment. So the first thing that I did was I had to eliminate my variables because you always have variables in an experiment. And so to eliminate some variables, each plant received three quarters of a cup of water daily and each plant was placed inside a 15 ounce pot. All the plants were under the light 24 7, not 365, but they were under the light 24 7. All plants were in the same area, they're in my parents' greenhouse, and each bulb that I used was a 60 watt bulb. Now, the materials that I used for this experiment, I of course had potting soil, I used five different 20 ounce containers, a water, ruler, I use seeds. Now, I didn't exactly use seeds, but you can sprout your own seeds. I use pre-grown plants. I had my five different light sources. I had five different colored light bulbs. I had white, yellow, red, blue, and green. And then a warm place, which a greenhouse is a warm place. And no taking supplies. Now, let's see. How to do the experiment. If you want to do it yourself, you basically put your plants inside your containers, and then water them daily, and be sure to give them exactly the specific amount of water. And I did this experiment for two weeks, and these are the results that I got after two weeks. The white and the yellow light did the best, and I'll share the reason with you why they did the best here in just a little bit. 
the red and the blue light, they did okay, they lived, you know, they carried on their life, but they didn't grow as well, and I also was testing the flavor, how the lettuce tasted. I also noticed that the red and the blue light, the plants that were under those color light, the leaves tasted sour. Now the light, or the green light, the lettuce plant under the green light, totally died after about a week and a half of being under the green light. Now why did this happen? Well, we have the light spectrum. And the way God created it is that he put the plants, he put it so that the plants would grow specifically under white light because that is the spectrum that they grow best under. And so the yellow light was the next closest one to the white light and so they were also able to grow fairly well under the yellow light. But the red and the blue and the green light was not anywhere near what the white light would offer, so therefore they did not grow as well, and as we already said, that the green light died. So, my hypothesis was rejected, and I found out that white light is always the best way to go when growing plants, and I also found out when you try and mess with God's creation, it usually never works as well, and sometimes it doesn't work at all. Thank you. And I believe the next person is Kitya.
physiological, I don't know how to say that word, but physiological processes. And it also directs the way a plant grows. So why should the experiment work, right? It should work because plants need nutrients and all the other stuff to grow, but then when you turn it upside down, it will turn because of the oxen. Because of the oxen, we will be like, oh hey, you're upside down, you need to turn. So it will turn and then it goes straight up. My project is called Hungry Fungus. This is a project about yeast. And um, something that a lot of people don't know that I didn't know for a long time, that I find very interesting about this, is that yeast is not a chemical, it's actually a living organism. It's a microorganism. And so that is what my experiment is based on. Um, so my, my problem, or my question, was does yeast require a food source to produce carbon dioxide? And uh, I did a little bit of research beforehand to uh, see if uh, what I should do for uh, about this yeast project. Um, and I noticed there are several ways that I could have gone. I could have experimented with temperature um, or whether this was in a uh, light area or if it was in a dark environment. But I decided to um, stick with just the one variable of whether or not there was sugar in, uh, in the environment. So uh, I came up with the hypothesis that uh, a bottle that has sugar with yeast will inflate the balloon, and the bottle that does not have sugar will not. This should happen because yeast is a living organism that requires food to perform its functions. So uh, this hypothesis was, uh, is based on the idea that uh, yeast needs sugar in order to go through cellular respiration. So, uh, in my procedure, I uh, took the materials that I needed and uh, I uh, started with measuring out a fourth cup of 100 deg degree tap water into both of my bottles. Then I measured two teaspoons of yeast into both of those bottles as well. And then to one of those bottles, I added two teaspoons of sugar. Now, uh, as soon as I did this, as quickly as I could, I took a balloon that I uh, made sure to remove as much of the air from it as I could, and stretched it over to the mouth of the bottle, of both bottles, and then I carried them into uh, the cooler that I had set up in the bathroom with an aquarium here and a jar filled with water to keep it warm in. Um, and so this was my, my uh, warm, dark environment that I kept them in. I put them both in there so that they would both be in the same environment, and were the uh, only variable that would be changing was the, uh, whether there was sugar or not in the solution. So, uh, after I put them in this uh, cooler that was actually supposed to be warm, though it wasn't actually cold, uh, I uh, observed the bottles uh, after uh, 12 hours, I left them in there for 12 hours, and I observed them after that 12 hours to see what they had done, and I recorded my results. So, uh, my independent variable was uh, whether or not there was sugar in the bottle, and my dependent variable was whether or not the balloon inflated. And, of course, the control group was the bottle that did not have sugar, and my experimental group was the bottle that did have sugar. So, the results that I came up with after observing it after 12 hours, um, I noticed that one balloon, the one that did not have sugar, uh, had not uh, expanded at all. It was limp. And the other one that did have sugar 
and expanded, and I measured it, it was four inches tall. Now, I had previously done this experiment, kind of just to test it, to make sure it would actually work, and uh, I just kind of set it in there, and uh, it actually worked a lot better than I had expected. And so I measured it, and it was four inches uh, for being in there. Um, and so actually this did prove my hypothesis. But my conclusion was that my experiment shows that yeast must have sugar present in order to function properly. <coughs> Proving my hypothesis as only the, body, the bottle with sugar ex expanded the balloon. These were the results because of the nature of yeast. Yeast is a fully living or microorganism which undergoes cellular respiration. Cellular respiration consists of a cell receiving sugar and through a process to convert it into usable energy, it, produ it pr produces waste materials including carbon dioxide and a little bit of alcohol. It is this carbon dioxide that fills the balloon with gases. So, uh, Oh, and also something I forgot to mention was uh, when I was doing this experiment, I wasn't actually able to keep it at the exact temperature that I was wanting. Um, I did some research and it was, I should have probably done it closer to 90 degrees, but I kept it um, as hot as I could, which was 82 degrees. Uh, Evening, everybody. Okay, so before I get into my project, I'll tell you a little story. One day I was visiting one of my friends from church, and we were in her garden, and she's like, okay, Julia, it's time to water the plants. And I was like, okay. So I put the plants on the leaves, like plant, like I watered the top of the plant. She said, no, Julia, I put the water at the bottom of the plant. I was like, that doesn't make sense. Because the top of the plant are where things are growing. That's where it's supposed to be. And she's like, no, you put the water at the top of the plant, and that's how things grow. And so that is what fueled my uh, whole project, is why is it that water, um, you put water at the bottom of the plant, and it goes upwards. That it makes sense for water to go up, right? Because everything, you know, comes down, right? That's the whole law of gravity. So my hypothesis is, if um, if a plant is water at the base, then the water will go upwards due to turner pressure, because it's the only pressure I had learned about. And my pro uh, experiment process, I found this experiment from a source, I don't know what I named, um, and um, you put food coloring in water, and that shows how the water is going from the plant, or from the bottom of the plant to the top, right, to the petals, where you can obviously see the change in color. Um, for this experiment, I didn't have an independent variable, because I just assumed that if you didn't put food coloring in water, then the color wouldn't change the plant. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, my um, experiment took about two days until the plants started to uh, change color. Now, the thing I didn't think about, I had used blue and green, but I didn't realize that plants don't really process green well. The whole thing about the chlorophyll and everything. So my green plant turned out to be yellow. Yeah, so that was the only thing that, next time I'll watch out for that because I forgot that plants don't like green, even though they are green. And so this, Product work because I learned due to adhesion, and adhesion is the attraction to molecules, right? So when water evaporates out of the top of the plant, that creates a negative pressure. So the water at the bottom of the plant wants to go upwards towards the top of the plant, and that makes total sense now after I researched it. And I think, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> 